Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Welcome those watching online. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we welcome your spirit here in this place. Have your way tonight, Holy Spirit, as you use my tongue as the pen of a ready writer to minister words of life and wisdom to our hearts. Father, we open ourselves to the power and revelation and the truth of your word. Thank you, Father God, that you reside inside of our spirits as you lead and guide and direct us day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We're so blessed to have you here tonight. I'm going to teach you a message tonight that I have learned uh, back many years ago. Uh, uh, we spent time learning this in Bible school. It's a very foundational message, and it's very simple. It's very simple to do. It's very simple to operate in, but more importantly, it's critical because the message of my title tonight is how to train your spirit. And there is a spirit we all have, and I am talking about your human spirit, how to train your human spirit. Uh, we, I learned this, uh, our children learn about these principles, the understanding of us having a body that is the house that we're in. We have a soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions, but we are spiritual beings. And when we come to that age of accountability, our spirit dies to the awareness and revelation of Christ and who God is, and we are spiritually dead, not without spirits, but we're not alive unto God any longer. And we must, in those moments of life, come to know about Jesus and make Him our Lord and Savior. And when we accept Him into our hearts because we believe, and we speak, what happens? Our spirits are born again. And now that my spirit is born again and alive unto God, it has to be trained. Did you know just like, like your, your body has to be trained, your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, they have to be taught. They have to be trained. They have to be instructed. Your spirit, man, is the same thing. It needs direction. It needs teaching. It needs a, a discipline and instruction. And it needs to know how to be an effective part of who you are. We need to learn, as much as we put all this effort into our natural trainings of our soul and of our flesh, we go to the gym, we go to the college, we do all these things, how often do we actually train our spirit? Well, we have some simple rules that I'm going to give you tonight on how to train your human spirit. And the scripture we're starting with is Proverbs 20, 27 which says the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. Your spirit must be educated. Why? Because the Lord wants to use it as a lamp in your life. And in order for that to happen, it has to have some understanding, education. It has to be trained. It can't just be, oh, I'm a Christian. Well, there's more to just being a Christian. There's learning how to operate as a Christian, to live in this Christian life, to experience the fullness of who we are. We have to have training. Nobody is born into this world and just automatically comes out of their mother's womb knowing anything. They don't know, they know nothing. They don't come out knowing everything. They have to be trained. Our spirits are born again and alive, but they're infants. Paul talks about, I have to keep feeding you the milk of the word. You ought to be grown up enough to be able to eat the meat. You ought to have enough teeth in the spirit to be able to nourish yourself on the depths of the word of God. And yet, so many of us live our whole Christian life, oh, we got gray hair and fat and retired, but on the inside, we're still infants living on the milk of the word. And God says he wants you to grow and to understand how to grow. And so we're going to go and show you four ways, and these four rules, I'm calling them, to the human spirit is, and we're going to look at each one of these, meditating on the Word, practicing the Word, giving the Word first place, and instantly obeying the voice of the Spirit. Now, I want you to notice about this, three of these, of these four rules, are specifically tied to the Word of God. So there's no way for your spirit to mature outside of the Word of God. Well, I go to church every time the doors open. doesn't say that. We're going to see what the Word of God says, and nowhere does it say, go to church, you'll automatically grow up. Come on. If I stuck my five-year-old 
you know, in, in the cubicle at work, that doesn't mean they know what they're doing. Just because we're around things doesn't mean we know how to operate in them. So we've got to recognize the power of the Word of God. If you put these four rules to work in your life, and you give it time, and you give it practice, the disciplines, just like we had in every other way we learned, if you'll do those same things with these four rules, you will begin to see and understand the will of God, which is His Word, but it'll, it'll be understood in the minor and most detailed aspects of your life. Not just the critical life or death things, but all the way down to the minor things of life. The little minor things of don't lose your cool at Walmart. The minor little things of how to not say what's going on between your ears. The discipline of your tongue. How to bridle it, the Bible says. All those little nuances that make you who you are. When you learn to train the Spirit on the inside of you to the principles of God's Word, you will learn to hear God in the minorest and smallest details of your life. It won't just be those major critical areas. Who do I marry? Should I go to this job? What church should I go to? It's all the way down to, hey, don't go right on to Aspen. Go on left on down and take the next intersection and go here and don't turn there and, hey, don't, don't turn that TV on right now. Hey, don't reply to that Facebook post real quick. Just hold on. Minor things. Man, how many times have we all done that and thought, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, you did. Because you were trained enough to know better, but we didn't listen to it. The, the vast majority, honestly, in my younger days, in my early 20s and, and, and my late 20s, probably up until my early 30s, most of my training spiritually came because I made so many mistakes. And I realized I made them, and I decided, and, and to this day, as I pastor, this is still very much a part of my life, I'm very critical on being aware of learning through mistakes. What did I do wrong there? I know I had an intention, but it didn't play out that way. Why? I know I heard what God said, but why didn't it? Because you this and because of that. And I try to learn from those things. When we've had people come to church and then leave, why? You can be all crybaby about it, be upset about it. You can say, well, what happened? You know, sometimes you just, it ain't, it ain't got anything to do with you. But you can make it all about you if you want to, but why waste your life doing that if it really isn't about you? So evaluating and understanding maturity, just like in the natural, we must do in the spirit, okay? It is through the Spirit, you must remember this, it is through your natural human spirit. It is not through your mind, it is not through your reasoning faculties, it is not through your flesh. He communicates, God talks to you in and through your human spirit. When God said in Proverbs 20 that the spirit of, the, of man is the candle or the lamp of the Lord, what was he saying? He means he's going to use the man's spirit, the, the, the person of you, your spirit, to enlighten you and to guide you. He's not going to use all the natural fleshly things or the disciplines of the mind. He's going to use the spirit to enlighten and to lead and to guide you. And so number one, let's look at this rule number one. We must meditate on the word. Meditating on the word is what we must realize in what we're talking about here is the value of God's Word. What is God's Word worth to you? What's the value of God's Word? Because ultimately, the things you value, you will invest in. Your time, your thoughts, your energy. And if you don't find the Word of God important because it's not interesting or it's hard to read or here's the lovely excuse all of us have made, I'm just too busy, Pastor, then you really just don't value it. Because the things you value, you will find time for. So if we're talking about meditating on the Lord, it really comes down to what do you value. The most deeply spiritual men and women of God give time to meditation in the Word. They're not just because of their eloquent speech. If they're going to have any sincere operation of the Holy Spirit in their ministry, it's because of the time they spent meditating on the Word. 
It is not the time they spend in the mirror learning to sound eloquent and to make the right gesture in the right moment for everybody to go, <gasps> it's all about how much the Word is in you and how alive it is and how sensitive you are. Ultimately, that's what's going to make the lasting impact in a person's life is allowing the Holy Spirit to be the revelator as I stand here and minister he takes my words and causes revelation in your heart and your mind comes alive because of what God is saying that is way more lasting and powerful than just in a moment of emotion or sensitivity to an expression or a tone or or lights on the wall that that stuff is not what makes a good service oh in the flesh it does but a lasting improvement of life, a change of who I am, comes from the Holy Spirit. And that comes through the time you spend meditating on the Word of God. You cannot develop spiritual wisdom without meditation. You will not grow in your spirit without time for meditation. You've got to meditate on the Word. God made that fact known to Joshua. In the very beginning of Joshua's ministry, Moses has died, he has come into leadership, and at the very beginning of this time, a critical time in Joshua's life, what does he say to him in Joshua 1.8? The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. In other words, don't be preaching what you don't know. He says, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Oh, I know what the Bible says, but have you meditated on it? He says, meditate on it. Stop talking about everything you know without really knowing it. How many of us know, know people we all call know-it-alls? They, they know everything. They don't know anything. They just know in their mind. But boy, if you had them on the side of the road with your car broke down, they'd be just as lost as you are, even though they've watched all those shows on television and they think they know everything about it. There is a difference between knowing the word in your mind and meditating on it so it becomes a truth in your life and so that it becomes a maturing aspect of your life. My kids can sit around and listen to me talk about things I enjoy and they can pick up the phrases and they can say this, but they don't really know. My wife is forced to sit there and watch basketball while I watch it. And so she pretends to act like she knows what's going on. But she don't really, and she don't really care. It's just enough so that we can have a conversation. That's all that really matters to her. And it's no different for me with purses or jewelry or makeup or fingernails or toenails. I got daughters, so my whole life is consumed with female stuff. And I don't care about any of it, but I need to know enough to be in the conversation. I don't know anything about fingernail polish. I don't. I only know enough to just be in the conversation. Are you hearing me? This is a lot of our Christian life. We just know enough to look Christian. But we really don't know anything about what we're talking about. Because we're not meditating. He says, hey, stop talking about how smart you are, but meditate day and night th that you may observe to do according to all that is written. In other words, the more you meditate on it, the more you'll know how to do what you fill in your head with. You won't just know it, you'll experience it. You'll have the, the wisdom to operate in it. And he says, when you do that, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Not God will. Not the Holy Spirit will. He said, you will. You will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Why? Because you have meditated on the word to the place where it becomes a revelation on the inside of you and you are able to operate in what you are reading and not just reading it to get the knowledge to sound like you know what you're doing. One translation of this says, and then you will be able to deal wisely in the things of life. God told Joshua that if he would meditate in the Word, his way would prosper. His way would be good. You know, we talked a couple weeks ago on a Sunday morning about having a willing mind. And we talked about, in that sermon, how Joshua is instructing us in Joshua 1a to, 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 to not just read the Word, but once that we meditate on it, and once we understand it, then to speak the word. And how important it was to not just read the Bible, 
but to meditate on it so that when you speak it, you're speaking from a place of revelation. And your mind has to be willing to, 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 to stop long enough to let the Holy Spirit reveal to you what it is saying. So many times our minds are, are reasoning and racing and trying to explain and trying to find a process that we never let God's Word percolate and just set in our belly long enough for us to listen to down here instead of up here. Oh, I read it. I know what God means there. Here's what I'm going to do. And we end up in a mess because that's not what God meant for you. That's just what you saw someone else do with it. And we said this about meditation. Reading the word in Joshua 1.8 never is mentioned. It's not about how much you read the Bible. It's about how and the ways you are reading the Bible. It's not like I got 30 minutes, I'm going to read through my three verses and my chapter of Proverbs and I've done my duty. It's not obligation we're talking about here. If we want to grow spiritually, we're going to have to stop looking at the Bible as some obligation. We said this, meditation is taking a truth that we read in the scripture and then think on it over and over until we see its fulfillment or its truth in our imaginations. We have to see the word of God so alive inside of us that it becomes a truth to us, not just a principle or a bunch of words on a piece of paper. By stripes I'm healed. Okay, that's what it says. But do I really grasp its truth? See, to do that, I've got to take time and meditate and think about it. what does all of that mean? I mean, break the words down. Every time I study, I am trying to break the simplicity of the word that I'm preaching down so far that I just make it impossible to not understand it right here. Not like, oh yeah, I, I got it, preacher. I've heard this 50 times. I'm not asking you how many times you've heard this kind of message. I'm asking you whether you have that revelation as your own. And if you do, then there will be fruit. And while I'm not allowed to judge you, I am certainly allowed to examine what fruit's going on in your life. And that fruit ain't going to come from your head. It's going to come from the innermost being, your belly. We were talking about how meditating is literally digesting God's Word. Take time. Take time to meditate. If you're not a big time, if you don't have a, a, you know, a lot of effort in this, if you've not done this before, just say, you know what, I'm going to take 15 minutes a day, and I'm not going to try to read as much as I can. I'm going to find, I, I was talking to a young man a, a few weeks back. He was asking me about how I study the Bible. I said, well, at your age, I just looked at my life and said, what are the things I don't like about me that I want to improve? And I took one, and that's what I went and focused the Bible on. I didn't start, you know, I'm just, I just need to grow up. Well, how do you do that? I mean, you know, that's like a broad statement. I need to grow up because I'm too angry. My temper's too. So I went to the Bible, and I found out in the back of the Bible, back then it didn't have the Internet. It was so easy now. Now you could just Google scriptures on your temper, and 5,000 scriptures pop up. But in the old day, all you had was the back of the Bible where you could look up a word. And, and those were the scriptures, and I'd read them in the, the King James, the New King James, the Amplified, every, the Living. I would read them in all the different translations, and then I would go and get my books from Bible school, and I'd try to find something on, on, on my emotions, and I'd read that. And that's what I'm talking about. Get the information so then I can take it and think about what that says in the different verses. And that now you can get online and you can take that same verse and you can find every Greek and Hebrew word that that word came from and you can deep and deep and deep and deep. And what is it doing? It's filling your mind with things to imagine and to think about and to ponder so you can say, Father, thank you that your Holy Spirit reveals to me, my spirit, the understanding of how to make that work in me. Because I'm frustrated, at, I'm tired of being angry all the time. And your word says, 15 minutes of that every day. Before long, you'll be finding multiple 15 minutes throughout your day. Because you'll start to realize the benefit of it. You'll start to get that truth. It's not, boy, I hope pastor preaches on this the spirit of anger today no you do it preach on it yourself preach to your own anger 
Boy, I have preached sermons that never came out of my mouth to myself because I meditated on the Word of God. I, I know what I heard. I know what I saw. You just take time. It is, it is a development. You are maturing your spirit because, first of all, you're being mindful of your spirit. You're being inward-minded instead of outward-minded. What it'll do is it'll start to see, you'll start to see some growth. What do I mean by that? You'll start to see an interest in the Bible more. That, I'm not saying you'll just quit your job and go to school, Bible school. I'm saying you'll just suddenly find that you have a desire. You know, I remember when my wife was potty training my kids, they did not have any interest in that toilet at all. But with time... Somewhere the light bulb came on and they figured out this is a better idea and they just started doing it. No need. Why? Suddenly they understood. That's exactly the same way in our spirit. We may not see the value of it at the beginning. That's because you've just been doing it the lazy flesh way. But now I'm starting to see the benefit. Why? Over and over and over and over. Just be patient. Just practice. Practice, practice, practice. Everybody meditates a little bit different. There is no one way. You know how to focus your mind on something. You ever wanted to buy something really bad and you just can't stop thinking about it? And you think about the color and the smell and you see everybody else driving one all of a sudden. And why? You're meditating. You're just pondering and thinking. Well, do that around the Word of God and the Holy Spirit who's on the inside of you, will begin to speak to your human spirit and you will begin to mature. My children did not learn words by walking around a house, nobody talking. They learn words by everybody talking. Talk, 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 and suddenly they learn words. How many times did you say to your baby, Daddy, Daddy, can you say Daddy? And suddenly, long enough, da, 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 Daddy. Why? Same thing. The Holy Spirit has the word coming in your mind and you're meditating on it and you're giving life to that season of maturing. You're not going to mature in your spirit, growing up in Christ without taking time to meditate. Rule number two for training your spirit is you've got to practice the word. You know that word you're meditating on, somewhere you've got to start doing something with it. It's so important, these things. Practicing the Word means simply being a doer of it. James 1.22 says, Be a doer of the Word and not hearers only. Watch this. Deceiving yourself. Now notice something about this. We know in Romans, it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And yet James is saying, if you're only a hearer, you'll deceive yourself. So faith comes, but that faith that came... I can actually deceive myself because it's not about only hearing the word. It is about doing the word you hear. Ultimately, if you don't do the word you hear, you will begin to be deceived. You will believe more highly of yourself, more spiritual of yourself. You will believe you don't need a church and a local family. That I can just hear the word from anywhere. I can watch it online. I can hear it in a podcast. I don't need to go to church. And you will deceive yourself. And then when things happen in life and you need an actual body, nobody will help you because you don't have one. They're not going to come off their television and bury your family. Pray for them in the hospital. Help you with your bills. You see, deceived. Why? They just listen and listen and listen and listen and listen and they got all this knowledge, but they have no experience with it. Listen, we have a lot of people in the church today that are talkers about the Word. We have a lot of people in the church today that rejoice about the Word. They love the Word. They love Jesus. But they're not big doers of the Word. We've got to be doers. If our spirits are going to grow, there has to be some action to the meditation. How do you act on the Word? How are you a doer of the Word? Here's where it starts. In all the circumstances of your life, in every aspect of how you live your life, in your marriage, raising your kids, your job, driving, 
you know, walking in the shopping cart, all the aspects of your life. What does the word tell me to do in those instances? In that Walmart while I'm walking down the aisle, no, I don't need him to tell me what bread to buy, but oh, I need him to tell me to get my attitude in check. I need, to, I, I need him to tell me, quit being so fearful of money, you tightwad. You're walking around with your, cash, your, your calculator adding up the pennies and subtracting your coupons that you took 14 hours of your life you'll never get back, cutting out of the magazines. Because you want to be the person on TLC who bought 5,000 shopping carts for $4 so you can bury it in your basement. But we'll never give anybody or loan anybody or be generous to anybody. Oh, it's me. I better move on. It's got quiet in here. I need the Holy Spirit to say, hey, you're a tither. Quit being so cheap. I'm not saying don't be smart. I'm not saying your frugal ways are of the devil I'm saying that we can go in one ditch or the other but being sensitive being a doer of the word in my life not just trying to do it in church not just trying to do it to get in the ministry but I mean in my house when no one's looking around between my husband and my wife in my car on the way to work when they cut me off and I pull up out of my neighborhood and instantly the traffic is so bad my blood starts to boil It right there is where I've got to be a doer of the word. Some of us have thought that actually doing the word just simply means, well, I just do the Ten Commandments, Pastor, and I'm a doer of the word. Well, actually, that's not true any longer. Because James chapter 1 is not talking about the Ten Commandments. Why? Because James 1 is written for a different covenant. You and I don't live under the Old Testament. We live under a new covenant built on better promises. So we, we, we have a lot of people in the world today that love to cram the Ten Commandments. And I'm not saying anything wrong with the Ten Commandments. I'm not saying the Ten Commandments have done, been done away with. They've been fulfilled in Christ. What did Jesus tell us to do? Jesus said in John 13, 34, do the Ten Commandments. Nope. He said, a new commandment I give to you. A new one. Not another one. He didn't give us an 11th. He said a new one. The other 10, I'm going to give you a way to live those 10 in one. I'll tell you how to live according to the 10 commandments. By my commandment. My commandment is this. Love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. In other words, you won't do anything bad that's on the 10 commandments if you love. If love is your motivator, you will do and be obedient. A doer of the word will do what Jesus said. A doer of the word will walk in love. Oh, I hate that person. Oh, don't say you hate. How can you say you hate people and love God? He said you can't be that way. You're not a Christian when you hate people. Oh, we want to hate. I mean, my flesh wants to really hate a person. But no, I don't allow it because that's not me. The more mature I am, the more my spirit is trained, the more it rises up when my flesh wants to hate and says, hey, Jesus said to love, so you don't get that option, so stop. Bite your mouth, shut your lip, put on that Sunday morning phony smile and move on. And in the car, repent and deal with it. Come on, every common day part of life, right? Paul said that love is the fulfillment of the law. If you walk in love, you won't break any one of the laws because the laws were just there to curb sin. And that's what love does. Love curbs the sin. Being a doer under the new covenant means that you and I, under the, the covenant of Jesus, which we call the New Testament or a new covenant, we are primarily to walk in the doing of the word according to to the epistles what's the epistles the books written after acts basically we are to walk according to the doing of the word by the lifestyle under the new covenant which is in the epistles paul reveals to us what moses revealed to the old testament with the ten commandments paul did 
in the New Testament called the epistles. These are the letters that were written to the church, which is who? You and I. So if we spend all our time in the Old Testament trying to live like David or Daniel or Joseph, you're missing the point. Their lives are great examples and testimonies to all of us, but we are to live according to the principles of the Spirit that is found in the New Testament. And we have the Spirit of God, the life of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. They weren't in the Old Testament. So we can't live trying to live to a standard in the Old Testament when we are to live under the principles of the New. Let me give you an example of this. Philippians chapter 4 gives us some interesting instructions about how we are to live our life. It says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. We're talking about being a doer of the word. By being a doer of the word, you're training your human spirit. All right? So here it says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Well, we love part of that. We love the whole prayer part. So we like to pray. But here he's clarifying your prayer life must begin by not being anxious. So if we're praying in fear and worry and anxiety, if all we do is walk around trying to pray ourselves out of being afraid, you're honestly wasting your time because he said, before you pray, don't be anxious. How many of us have had children? Do you remember when they were teenagers and you would say, I want you to go put all the stuff up in your room until it's clean? And then you go in there and the room is clean and you think, great. But they didn't put it all away. They just shoved it under the bed and pushed it in the closet till the door shut. That's not what you said. Technically, the room looks clean, but they didn't do what you said. And this is exactly what we do with the Bible. Oh, we love to be prayers, but we're all anxious. You know what the Amplified Version says of this? It says, do not fret or have anxiety about anything. So our prayer lives really should begin with an attitude adjustment. Am I fearful? Am I being fretful? Am I full of anxiety? Is this worry driving me to prayer? Because here he's telling me to be a doer of the word. I'm not supposed to have any of that. So what do I need to do? I need to go back and cast the care of these things onto the Lord. Father, I'm just, I'm just worried about this thing and I don't like this and I'm giving it to you. I'm casting the care of this onto you. I'm not going to spend 30 minutes explaining why and giving you the how comes and it's not fair and life. I just give it to you. And you said you would take it from me. And so I'm giving it to you and I'm not picking it back up. And you know what I might need to do? I might need to pray in the Holy Ghost for a few minutes. Because Jude says I'll build myself up in my most holy faith when I do that. So I might have said the words, I'm giving it to you. But I'm like still holding on to it with my death grip. So I need to pray in the Holy Ghost till it comes off. And the joy of the Lord, the peace of God will stir up on the inside of me. And once I've calmed the anxiety, then I'm going to walk back to the, 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 the prayer chamber and say, All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, I bring this. And now I can petition him because I dealt with the anxiety. Oh, no, that's too much work, preacher. We just want to pray between house and job. All this getting ready and faith stuff. No, no, we're doers of the word. This is what it looks like. What am I doing? Maturing, growing up. I could say clean your room or I could say hang the clothes back up on the hanger. One way teaches them to be an adult. The other one, they're 30 years old and they're still digging their clothes out of the laundry hamper. Why? One's trained, one knows. Spirit can't just know it needs to be trained to do what's right and here we're being told how to do it right you want to pray and petition god get rid of the anxiety the fret and the worry see this kind of prayer don't work an over anxious prayer full of fretfulness doesn't work you become so fearful you got belly knots in your belly you can't sleep you can't eat you're on anxiety medicine we need to deal with the anxiety before we go talking to God about our money problems. That's doing the word. Notice verse 7. 
verse 7 of Philippians 4 is the result of doing verse 6 properly. So we deal with the anxiety and the fret. We pray and petition. And what happens? And God's peace, which transcends understanding, will garrison and mount guard over your heart and minds. And where are the minds? The minds are in Christ Jesus. The mind is in Christ Jesus. That's a meditated mind. It's in the place of Christ. Your word says, you have promised. I stand upon your, your, your faithfulness. What you did for me, I believe and receive. See, in those moments, I've dealt with it. I've cast the care. I've prayed in the Holy Ghost and built myself up. And then I petition and pray in faith. And what happens is peace that transcends all the understanding of the reason and worry and doubt and all of that. What happens? A guard rises up. A garrison is mounted around my heart and my mind. Many people want the seventh verse. They all love the idea of that, but they don't want to practice the sixth verse. We all want the guard and the mounted and the heart and everything right. But do we want to do verse 6 right? No, we just want to pray and God show up and guard our heart. God's peace will guard your heart and your mind. But you're going to have to be a doer of the word. A doer of the word. So can you reap the results? Can you have peace without being a doer of the word? Verse 7 really will never work in your life if you don't get verse 6 right. That's a doer of the word. I can sit in a car with a five-speed manual shift, and I can push it around in park and just, you know, pretend like I'm shifting your gears, but go nowhere. I can do all the outward things that look like but have no success. If we want to go somewhere, I actually have to push the clutch in, turn the key on, learn how to balance the clutch and gas, Put it in first and move the car. Verse 6. See, verse 7 is driving down the road. Things will start to happen. Well, I'm a doer of the word. How are you a doer of the word? Well, I prayed and I went to church. But you prayed full of fear. So no peace showed up. No garrison showed up. So you just keep praying over and over and over the same prayer. And that's why we find people praying for 20 years over the same thing. People who worry and fret and continually think on the wrong side of life will never see verse 6 and 7 come to pass. And here's what verse 8 tells us. Verse 8 goes on to clarify how to be a doer of the word by telling you how to think. So first he says, get anxiety dealt with, then pray. And what, when you do that, You'll have peace and a garrison and a mount around your heart. And then verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, are noble, are just, are pure, are lovely, are of good report, if they got any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So now, once you're in a guarded place where your heart is guarded, don't get lazy. Now you've done verse 6 and verse 7. Here's how you keep doing it. You do verse 8. That's a doer of the word. I've prayed. I've got dealt with my emotions. I'm, I'm charged in my spirit. Now what do I do? Because maybe it didn't change and everything in the natural is the same. But what do I do? Now I meditate. I go back to meditation. And I only meditate on what's noble and just and good and pure and lovely. I don't start measuring, meditating on the watch, on my feelings, on my wallet, on Facebook, on the world, on the media. I thought Trump would be back in the office by now. You're meditating on the wrong thing. You're missing the point. You're hearing me tonight. Hallelujah. So many of us, we go through all this work and effort to do something, and then we don't hold on to it. We just get sloppy in it, and before long, our minds start to slip back into thinking, anxiety and worry and fear, and before long, what you think about, you're talking about. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you're filling your spirit with the meditations of the word, you're going to continually speak it. It's it's just going to continue to charge your heart. Are you hearing me? 
You tell your children a hundred times if you tell them once. You show them a thousand times. And then one day they wake up and they just know how to tie their shoes. No, they didn't just know how to tie their shoes. I said a hundred times, I showed them a thousand times, and it was the thousandth and once, it's now theirs, and from this moment on, they've matured. One little more step to life. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when we continue to worry, we continue to fret, we continue to think on the wrong side of life, what do we begin to do? We begin to erode all the work of being a doer, all the effort that got us to the right place. We start just unloading it, just start redoing it, tearing all the guarding and the power and the authority that we have down. You cannot be a doer and continue talking unbelief. The more you talk about something, the bigger it gets. If something is running through your mind and it doesn't meet the qualifications of Philippians 4, 8, truth, honesty, justice, purity, lovely, don't think about it. Don't talk about it. Meditate on what is good, what is just. Remember, God's Word is working. Just because I don't see it or feel it or notice anything doesn't mean He's not working on our behalf. He is the author and finisher of my faith. All right, number three. Give the word first place. So we meditate on it, we practice it, and then we don't practice it last, we do it first. The training, development, and education of your spirit comes by giving the word of God first place in your life. The first thing we do in a situation of life is, what does the word say? Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. My son, give attention to my words, give heed to them, put them first incline your ear to my saying listen to what i have to say that's what he's saying pay attention give heed to it do not let it depart from your eyes keep looking at the word the more you look at it the more you'll think about it the more you'll go to it keep them my words in the midst of your heart for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh this scripture has so many rich dividends to it why is it that God keeps telling us here, put his word first, listen to what I'm saying, keep looking at what I've said, keep my word in your heart. Why is he saying that? The margins of the King James tell us why. Because it's medicine to our flesh. It's health. It's medicine. Why? It's medicine. It'll medicate. It'll help. It'll produce life in you. It'll grow you up. There is healing in the Word of God. There is medicine in the Word. The first thing we do when challenges come is we medicate it with the Word of God. We should train ourselves to ask any matter of our life, what does God think about this? What would God's Word tell me to do here? Well, the more I'm meditating, the more I'm thinking, the more I'm studying it, the more it's in my eyes and my ears and my heart, the, the, the more likely it is you're going to know what to do. You might not even remember chapter and verse, but you'll just have a knowing right here what to do. We should ask ourselves what God has to say about anything going on in our life first. You know, sometimes our family and our friends try to rush us into things. Pressures of life want us to make decisions quicker than we should. But we really should take pause when we have an uncertainty, when we have a doubt. Don't let pressure get you to make decisions that you didn't consult God with or His Word about. If, if, they're, if they're constantly pushing you, pushing you, the answer is no. You're not going to force me to make a decision before I'm prepared. Now, I'm not saying go to the other ditch and never make one. But I'm saying I'm going to make a decision because I took time to pursue God first. What His Word said. What I, I know, but you're pressuring me and it's not coming to my mind. I'm letting you get me thinking about your idea instead of thinking about what the Holy Spirit has to say. So you need to go to God's Word first. You need to slow down and stop getting so impulsive all the time. Amen? Lastly tonight, I don't know how else to explain giving the Word first place. You just got to do it first. I, don't, I couldn't think of any other way to say it, so it wasn't a very long point. It's like, do it first. 
really this is one of the most important ones, and that's obey the voice of your spirit. The more you can instantly obey the Holy Spirit, the more you will church. Let me say it this way. The, the more you obey your spirit, the more it will mature. When you have been told something and you know to do, for instance, when I learned to get my driver's license, they told me how to drive a car, all right? So my dad takes me out, walks me through all of it. I have all the knowledge of it, but now I got to do it. And the more I did it, and the more I did it, and the more I did it, the more I did it, the more I did it, it became instant. I didn't have to get in the car and take five minutes to remember. It just became natural, second nature to me. Now, I, I don't even think about how to drive a car. I just know how to drive a car. Are you following me? It becomes instinctual. It's instant. I know how to drive the car. I, I, I had a motorcycle given to me a few years back. I hadn't rode a motorcycle in 10 years. But the second I got on the motorcycle, instantly I knew how to ride it. Did not have to be taught at all. Knew exactly how. I had all the understanding of the process. Why? Because I had done it and done it and done it. The more you listen to that spirit on the inside of you, the more instant you do it, the more it will become instinctual. Because, see, your spirit, man, not the Holy Spirit, your spirit has a voice. We call it conscience. Sometimes it's called intuition or an inner voice or guidance what the world calls it is a hunch luck chance but what it is is it's your spirit you the real you speaking to you and every person alive today has a spirit and its spirit has a voice you know even an unbeliever has a spirit and their spirit has a voice every person alive has a conscience the human spirit has a voice called the conscience. And that spirit is an inward hidden man. We often have heard sermons called the, the hidden man of the heart. I think Pastor Jerry has one of those. I know he has a sermon on this. He's hidden because you can't see him. He's not hidden like we don't know where he's at. And he just kind of pokes his head out once in a while. No, he's not hidden. He's hidden from the eyes, from the flesh. He's hidden from the world. The world don't see it, don't understand it. But, but, but I am a spirit. This is the man that was recreated in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's talking about your spirit. Your conscience is the voice of that spirit. Your conscience isn't your spirit. It is the voice of your spirit. You are a spirit, and your spirit is recreated. It is a new creation. Old things passed away. All things have become new. That's in your spirit. Your flesh and your soul didn't change. This man is born again, and God prophesied this in Ezekiel, and he prophesied it in Jeremiah, and he said there would be a time when he would take the old stony heart out of a man and put in a new one. He's talking about your spirit. He said that he would put us under a new covenant, that that spirit would become alive and be deposited into a place where it can flow and work together with his spirit. In the Old Testament, their spirits were not born again. The Holy Spirit could not reside in their spirits. Why? They were dead. The Holy Spirit had come on them. You remember Gideon? Gideon wanted to know what God said, so what did he do? He put out a fleece to find out what God says. You don't put out fleeces anymore. You do that, you'll get fleeced. Bad things will happen when you test God. He said, listen to my spirit. You can't go back to these Old Testament places and say, well, I'll just do what they did and God will have to move. No, because he lives inside of me. We must learn to be free from the need to have an emotion or a physical response every time we need to hear from God. Like, I need a goose bump for confirmation. Or I need pastor to say something in his sermon that is exactly what I think I heard God say in order for me to know that that is God. 
you and I must learn to develop a sensitivity to that inward voice, that conscience voice. How do you do that? You educate your spirit man by meditating on the word, by practicing that word, by being quick to do what it says, by understanding that my spirit is not in there, born again, alone. It is the same moment I'm recreated. How did that happen? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came on the inside of me and recreated within me. And then He dwells there. 1 John 4, 4. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He dwells in you. Not in your head, in your spirit. And God has to communicate to you through His Spirit to your spirit and your conscience will begin to speak to your mind and you will begin to know and understand and you'll have a knowing it's from here, but I'll hear it here. I'll have an understanding here, but it's coming from here. Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. There's a whole other level of, of a sermon here on how to hear God, which we've talked about. I'm talking about training and maturing your spirit. It is becoming aware of your conscience. You know, I've heard people say you shouldn't trust your conscience. That your conscience is not a safe guide. But that's not always true. The conscience is a safe guide when it's in the believer. When I'm a born-again person alive unto God, my conscience is now a safe guide. Why? The Holy Spirit resides in me. This is why so many people, when they're, they're born again later in life, they're so transformed from the inside out. I mean, they just are radically different. I grew up in church. I didn't have all this world to deal with and all this bad teaching to deal with. And so my life has been much easier as a Christian than somebody who spent 40 years of their life in the world and their conscience is so perverted by what the world has taught it. And now the Holy Spirit comes in and instantly they know, I will not do that again. Why? Why do they know that? This is where a lot of people like myself get into trouble because we, we never experience the don't do that. And so we reach a place in our life where we think we want to try it because it's not fair. And then we go over there and try it, and then we feel awful about doing it because we know we shouldn't be doing it. Where you were doing it, didn't know any better, and now you're alive unto God and suddenly realize, I know I'm not doing that again. What is that? Your, con- your spirit is alive, and now the conscience of your spirit begins to speak to you what the Holy Spirit, and that's why you go to church and you study the Word and you get around things because it feeds your spirit, and so your conscience can lead you in a new direction of life, and you'll do things so radically different, and your mind will know the difference between your before Christ conscience and your after Christ conscience. God uses your spirit to enlighten and to guide you. Paul said this in the Bible. He said, I always obey my conscience. Why? He was alive and mature in the Word of God, meditated on it, practiced it, did it first. Some people say, well, you're a minister. You know, the Holy Ghost deals with you differently than He does me. And I would agree with that in in this moment behind the pulpit. When I'm standing in the office I am called to, the Holy Spirit will enable me to do and to say and to think and to minister in a way that a layman may not experience. But in my everyday life, as a husband, as a father, as a man, he does not treat me differently because I have a call on my life and I'm in an office. I have to do exactly the same thing everybody else does. He speaks to us in an inward voice. The voice of our own spirit speaks to us. And if we miss it, We miss the opportunity of growth. When we reason it away, when we let flesh and feelings and other people argue what God is saying for us to do. This is the most dangerous part of learning to grow up in Christ, is having enough confidence in what God is saying to you that you don't have to go get man to confirm it. Yes, we all want prophecy. Prophecy is for edification 
exhortation, and comfort. We all need the office of prophet. We all need a pastor and an evangelist and a teacher and an apostle. But we need to learn to live in a place of maturity where I don't need to be dependent on confirmation all the time to know I'm hearing God. Oftentimes, I will ask counsel on how to do what God is asking me to do. But I've already decided I want to do it. But I can learn how to do it by the counsel and the wisdom of men. I can do it by the meditation and the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. Because I spent, all right, Father, you're telling me to go on a missions trip. All right, well, I'm going to stir myself up. You're going to encourage me in the Word. I'm going to study Scripture and meditate on the evangelistic work. I'm going to pray and study on healing and laying hands on people and, and a servant's heart. I'm going to pray about strengthening my flesh. Uh, all the things I need to do. And he's going to start to speak to me in that moment. And I may not notice anything different, but the moment I set my foot on the ground in that place, in that mission field, suddenly I'm anointed. And because I took the time to prepare myself, meditate, do the word, and go, I'm in the exact place that God will use me and anoint me and equip me. And I will see the blind eyes open. I will see the, the lame walk and the deaf here and I will see God use me in a powerful way or I could just say well a missions trip will get me out of work for 10 days and I don't do anything until we get down there and then all I do is gripe about the food and the water one's a place of growth in his spirit the other one will just revert back to his childlike state and everybody will wish we'd have left you home There have been a few I went on, I was like pulling my credit card out to pay for the airplane ticket. <laughs> what am I saying? I'm going to stop because I'm running long. I'm challenging you tonight that you just don't grow up spiritually. It does not just happen organically. You can't just hang around a bunch of mature Christians and become mature. How many of us can think, don't raise your hand, but how many of us can think about grown men or women in their 30s or 40s and we still think of them as children because in the way they talk and walk and act and behave, they hung around adults, but they never became adults themselves. They got the knowledge, but they never got the wisdom. So many of us lack the maturity of spiritual growth simply because these rules are not an everyday incorporated part of our life and I'm challenging you tonight to do that to step out and believe that I can do and be more than just a, a chair a body in a chair Sunday and Wednesday that I can grow and mature that my spirit and the voice of my spirit my conscience can lead me and by the power of the Holy Spirit be led and guided into all truth and understanding that I can get on top of worry and anxiety that I can pray in a prayerful way faith and that as I have prayed I can stay thankful and loving and kind and patient that I can meditate on the word practice the word put it first place in my life and instantly obey and in that environment is what we would call a spiritually mature person and there is no shortcut there is no way you can pay to get around it and you can't do it through attendance but you certainly won't do it without attendance you're going to have to be faithful you're going to have to find the place god called you to and get in there and when the word of god is deposited you take those notes home and you put them to practice in your life. Amen. Let's all make a decision tonight to, to train our spirits. To recognize that praying and practicing the word and meditating, it's not some religious obligation. It is a process of maturing and discipline. We are training ourselves, our real selves. You should not be putting eight or ten hours a week in your flesh and in your mind and not put any hours in your spirit. I'm all for training your mind and your, your body, but not at the neglect of your spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray and thank you for the power of your word tonight. 
We thank you, Father God, that our spirit man is alive to the revelation of this truth we've heard tonight. And that as we've heard it, the Holy Spirit comes alongside and begins to reveal and point out and speak to us. And our conscience begins to talk about the adjustments and the attitudes and the things that we've not done and need to do. And the disciplines of our time management and all the things required of us to be doers of your word and, and to put it first place in our life. And, and as you speak to us, Holy Spirit, we choose tonight to be sensitive to it and to listen to you and to follow after your leading and your prompting and to hear the voice of our conscience and instantly obey. And we will not allow anxiety and worry and fret to rob us of our doing of the word, but we will meditate on what is good and true and loving and right and pure and just. And we will grow up on the inside and become men and women of God who hunger and eat from the meat of your word because we are mature in the body of Christ. And we are your saints that are able and, and willing to be doers of your word and called to do and to set the example and to let our light shine bright in this world because we have matured and trained our flesh to obey the spirit that is us. Our minds will be disciplined because the meditation begins in the word and not on the world. And I bind the distractions and cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things that would erode our time of meditation and our confidence in your word that would steal us from being doers of your word and doing it first. Thank you, Father God, that we choose tonight to grow up in you and to do the work and the training and the management of our life is according to your edicts and not the edicts of the world. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. You receive anything out of that tonight? Yeah.